Well, Hi. ladies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, a conversation between two literacy-minded, passionate educators. I'm Dave Stewart Jr., and this is Tammy Elser. And I'm going to let Tammy tell you a little bit about herself here in a second. Uh, but the reason that I've wanted to have this conversation is because I've known Tammy now for a good number of years. We began our relationship corresponding um, in response mm -hmm. to some blog posts that I wrote, Tammy, you wrote in. Uh, but then eventually, I got the great delight to work with uh, Tammy in person and uh, doing professional development work um, out in Montana. And and what very quickly developed is just a friendship that I cherish because it always makes me excited about teaching. It always uh, it, it challenges me just because of how much passion Tammy naturally has, um, how much knowledge that she has, um, and, and it just it just kind of bubbles out from her. And I, I just wanted to give people a chance to to see what I mean. Um, and, and my hope with these conversations with people like Tammy, people like Jim Burke, is just to encourage younger, uh, earlier career educators to uh, consider that it's possible to engage with this work for a long time. Um, and that, you know, people like Tammy, me, Jim, so many others who who are making a career of this, uh, it, it's not because it's easy. Um, it, it's something way deeper, more beautiful than that. So, uh, Tammy, tell us, tell us, uh, you know, what, what do you do there at the college and, um, <laughs> just a bit about yourself. And then I'll ask some questions related to the history of your career. Well, I, golly, um, I am currently a full-time professor at Salish Kootenai College, which is a tribal college on the Flathead Reservation in Western Montana. It's the home of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, to whom I owe my career. So I, mm -hmm. I give um, enormous um, gratitude to, to the tribes for having hired me in my very first teaching position. I'm in my 40th year now and went from a tribal school, which was an alternative high school, to a public school where I worked for 22 years um, in both curriculum and um, golly, everything, curriculum, professional development, and, and taught. And I taught middle school. So um, we were just we were just bemoaning middle school and the, the wondrous age <laughs> middle school is. And um, I loved it, actually. I, I thrived on it, and I absolutely adored my students, many of whom are, are friends today. One lives across the driveway right over there um, <laughs> and um, is, has raised two twins, and it's fun to watch. Um, anyway, um, I grew up here in Western Montana, and I went to the University of Montana. Um, I accumulated so many degrees that I was virtually unemployable um, <laughs> while working full time as a as a classroom teacher. So I I have a secondary um, certification in English, another one, another degree that I'll actually make you guess at the end of this. Um, and then I got a master's in counseling and uh, finished my doctorate in curriculum and instruction mm -hmm. while raising two girls and and working full time as a teacher. So I never took a day or, or a year off to do it. It was just kind of the learning and the teaching were so entwined yeah. that I that that that, that I, I needed my classroom to test the ideas that I was learning. So um, yeah. other things weird about me, uh, I grew up. I, I grew up in a in an unusual family. My dad and my mom, who are still with me, are outfitters. Um, they take pe took people into the wilderness area by horseback, and so that's what I grew up doing. And my dad, who is ninety, um, just dropped his second book on the market, and we did a big book launch um, on the eleventh of of this month, and it was spectacular and I'm just delighted um it's a really lovely it's a really lovely book called Hush of the Land anyway so that's uh, my hush, story Hush of, hush the, of land? the Land mm -hmm. awesome and remind me of your father's first name Smoke say that again Smoke Smoke that's right Smoke yep. and, and, and there's there's some <laughs> smoke type of, yeah there's yeah. Some so type anyway of, it, it, it's been really of, some uh documentary that features him Yes, yes. Okay. Um, the Montana Montana um, uh, Public Television did a documentary on him about 11 years ago called Three Miles an Hour. So. Yeah, Three Miles an Hour, starring Smoke Elser. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
So he's a character. Um, he's a great storyteller. So I get it from him. <laughs> so I love Tammy. Um, how you talked about the fact that when you were getting your extra education, pursuing these advanced degrees, you kept teaching and that an interplay between these was very important to you. I love that you bring that up because a word or, or a term that you introduced to me um, or an idea is this idea of pervasive integration, mm -hmm. pervasive integration. And, and uh, you used it um, in describing my work. And, and at that time I had published these six things and, um, mm -hmm. and, and we were, we, you and I were talking a lot about the five key beliefs and you use, you, you, you described how, you know, this five key beliefs approach to student motivation is meant to be pervasively integrated into your pedagogy. It's not something that you just like tack on or, or a one-off lesson. Um, so, uh, this is going to, this is going to be pervasively integrated throughout our, throughout our time today. Um, I think this idea that that you gave me um, it is central to everything that I do. It's become yeah. um, it's it, it's become central to um, so many ways that I look at how excellent teaching, which should lead to excellent learning and outcomes for students, how those things work. And uh, a whole, ver I, I, I've never, I have not yet found an area where pervasive integration was not really what needed to be happening, what needed to be the ethos, yeah. um, if you will, of the of um, instruction and it, it will come up. It'll come up over and over again. Yeah. The master's degree that we've launched at Salish Kootenai College is grounded in the idea of pervasive integration. Oh, just fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so let's talk about uh, Indian education for all, which yes. is something that this applies to, um, mm -hmm. this idea of pervasive integration. So I, I, prior to visiting Montana for the first time and working with you for the first time, I was not aware of this, of this law that uh, existed in Montana pertained to education, but, but this became a major, a major component of your career, helping this yes. law to become something that was, that was good, um, that, that was actually happening in, in, a, in a quality way in classrooms across the state. So, so give us a, give us, um, give us that story of just how, how, where, where you were at in your career when this law came about and just how you ended up becoming, um, a leading voice and helping this thing actually. So, take you know, it, it, it started as, as an initiative that was brought to our, um, constitutional convention back in 1972. Okay. So I was a kid. I was yeah. I was really young, and it ended up um, that the that that we should be teaching a, in consultation with Montana tribes about the tribes and their histories and their cultures um, became part of the Montana Constitution. It's part of what a basic quality education in Montana is. Without it, you don't have. Montana history. You don't have U.S. history. You don't have, you know, deep, rich understandings of tribal sovereignty and tribal diversity and um, tribal cultures and languages, et cetera, all of all of those pieces. So it ended up it, it's resting in our Constitution, basically, with no funding, you know, <laughs> with no with nothing. And it and it languishes there until about 1998 when um, it became codified into law. And at that point, then there began to be some test cases, a lawsuit that was critical um, in finally in finally launching some funding and funding came forward in about 2005. So we've had funding for less than 20 years, but this has been on the books for six wow. going on 60 years. Right. It's a really long time. Um, mm. And so 50 something. Anyway, it's so, it's so um, what what we are called to do as teachers and it crosses all state agencies and organizations. It's not just in education. It's in it's in higher education. It's in fish, wildlife and parks. It's in it's 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 part of our part of our Constitution and basically part of the ethos of our state is to provide equitable and also authentic um, instruction and 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 teaching and understanding about the Montana tribes. So 
Mm. There are seven seven reservations, and and there are thirteen tribes that are federally recognized now. There what were twelve, and finally the Little Shell received their federal recognition. They're the only tribe without a land base, and these are sovereign nations who whose relationship with the United States predates the existence of the state of Montana wow. by over 30 years. Wow. Right. So we've got we've got these treaties, a series of treaties that the tribes were party to, most of them. Um, and they're each distinct. Every treaty is distinct to that that tribal group. And through those treaties, the tribes reserved land that was in their original aboriginal territory, their land base. They were reserving land for their own use. That's what a reservation is. It's lands that were reserved not by the federal government, but by the tribes through this vehicle of treaties. And it was coercive and it was, it had many, um, um, it's wildly, it's wildly, it's wildly complicated, but it, it, this, those treaties frame that relationship between the United States federal government and the, and the tribes themselves. And as a consequence, they frame everything about what it also means to be a Montana, to be, to be, um, a resident of the state of Montana. And, and so we've got this initiative and then we have all of this, we, we, we suddenly have all of these teachers going, I don't right. know what right. to teach. What's that? How do I, how do I do that? And it's really not about, and I'm certainly not a content expert. I am a, I am a pedagogy expert. I'm a how kind of gal, right? Mm -hmm. And the what, I rely on my tribal friends to help me get the what right. And I get it wrong m more often than not, but I, I work really, really, really hard at it. And one of the things that led to as I was trying to support the state in, in the implementation of Indian Ed for All is it led to this understanding that there were these there were these kind of foundational bodies of knowledge. I call them sets of knowns. There are things that yeah. when 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 a teacher has that and they go to conferences and they go to meetings and they're in investigating curriculum, when they have certain basic foundational understandings, it becomes much easier for them to learn and to learn in a way that's that's culturally responsive, that's really thoughtful and allows them to begin to build this body of knowledge that support them in their teaching. And I began by doing these really simple little quizzes with teachers basically cold, absolutely cold. I'd come in to do a workshop and I would drop a two page, one, one sheet of paper front and back map on there in front of them. And I'd say, just write the names of the tribes on each reservation where they are and then put the name of the reservation too. Because really, if you can't do yeah. that, can you actually teach? Yeah, really? Can can you, can can you, can you provide? It's, it's, the found, it's the foundational yeah. element that if you can't name yeah. People, if you can't place them geographically, what can you possibly know uh, that's that's that goes beyond stereotypes uh, yeah. about about the people? And and so so it became the same part of what I do. You know? <laughs> this method, I, 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 I loved this because uh, you, you you described for me how, you know, teachers would be kind of resistant to this, too. So some some would be. Uh, you know, help, help me, help me. How do I do? So, when you, when you initially, all. you start by posing the question, because we've got these, all these documents that have been out in the state for a long time now, right? 20 years. Yeah. But we started with the, these essential understandings that were created by tribal scholars from every part of our state got together and they, they defined this, this, these essential understandings. And when I would start to do a to do a workshop, I would pose the question, how many of you have heard of the essential understandings? And every hand would go up and then some eyes would start rolling. Right, right. Like, here, here we, we go, go again. again. Yeah. Here we go again. And then I would simply put the quiz down and I would <laughs> ask them, write them down. Yeah. And your paraphrase is good, by the way. I I I love I love when somebody's made it their own and they've paraphrased it in a way that makes it that makes it make sense to them as long as it's accurate, right? Right. But but then then they began to become aware, and we all have. We've all begun to be, become aware of how much there is to know and how much we don't know, and how 
how incredibly important these relationships are in being able to in being able to learn where the cultural boundaries are, understand um, aspects of of the of the history that that really where the where the sore spots are, and there are, there are horrible sore spots, right? Sure. There's a tremendous amount of pain. Yeah. Um, associated with boarding schools, associated with forced assimilation, associated with land loss, um, mm-hmm. and and all of those all of those aspects, and being able to address those things in a way that that makes um, not only not only is is sensitive and thoughtful, but also accurate, right? Right. Also fair, right? Right. And so those were all the all the bits and pieces. So so they get a white lady from Missoula who happens to be Norwegian and she ends up writing the framework document, which is a how document. And I had all okay. the support from my friend Julie, who was writing the what document and, okay. and many others um, who are tribal scholars. And and so we really. Um, it's kind of. That's and that's, we are. and, and, that's and, and it has to be renewed. Right. And you we continue to, to work this. on that. Mm-hmm. This continues yeah. to be a, a piece of your work, um, yeah. and 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 I just this this uh, when when you shared the story with me initially, I loved that we're we're starting with these sets of notes, and this is a yeah. this is really a, it's, a piece. It's like of, a basic skeletal structure. Yeah, and this is something that you bring to a lot of your even teaching of of prospective teachers. This idea of sets of knowns. Yes. And of course, I, I resonate with it because because of how critical I believe knowledge is to yes. deeper critical thinking, uh, good argumentation, uh, e- even motivation. Um, you know, how am I supposed to be motivated to provide a high quality Indian education for all if if I don't know what uh, the names of the reservations where they're located in my state? If I don't even know that, yeah. how how am I supposed to care? Um, mm-hmm. So. So um, sets of knowns in in preparing educators, there are other lists that you have, other types of you sets of knowns. That it's you gotten, use. It's what gotten are some big. Of those? Yeah, so, yeah, I bet it is. You know, it's it 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 went from those sets of knowns associated with with Indian Ed for All and my thinking about that and my my awareness that I was actually seeing teachers grow in their knowledge. And it was significant growth. It wasn't, it was significant growth and we could document it because I was giving these quizzes every time I sat down with anyone. I was like giving the quizzes out like, but but for me, what it what it led to is I began really looking at my my pedagogy and looking at what I'm trying to support my undergraduates and now my graduate students in understanding. Um, and I became aware that there's a there's a kind of a clover leaf um, diagram in the framework for Indian Ed for All implementation that I authored for the state. And it's got, think of it as four different quadrants, four different areas. One of those areas is concept. Okay. It's a conceptual understanding. And the concept can often be represented almost in a word, uh, like justice or balance, right? Mm-hmm. Then there's content. And we know what that is. We're really talking about the classic disciplines. We're talking about history. We're talking about mathematics. We're talking about social studies. And these are facts to be known. And they can be infinite in, 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 in the grain that they go down to. So we've got concept and content. Down below that, we've got skill sets. Mm. And the issue with skill sets is they tend to be empty vessels. They're they're devoid mm-hmm. of content. Right. Their processes and procedures. Right. They require content to give them form and meaning. Yeah, yeah. They require it. Then we have context. Context and content can flip back and forth. I can emphasize the context. I can make the context the context of the bitter Salish people. I can make the context the context of the Blackfeet Nation. I can flip that context around and I can get to all kinds of content by utilizing, by walking through the door of that context. So if you think of those as being kitty corner from each other, sure. but the ones that are universal are the concepts and the skill sets. The mm. concepts go across instructional domains mm. and the skill yeah. sets are the ways of exercising 
the memory that allows for long-term conceptual development, conceptual understanding of whatever that content is and whatever that context is, if I'm flipping the context, which I do um, quite frequently <laughs> anyway. So I call that my framework for 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 integration. And it's a curricular, um, it's a curricular understanding, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So it goes in, it goes in a, a there's a variety of, there's a variety of areas. Um, well, I, I, I use it across any kind of area where I'm actually, I'm actually developing and, and writing curriculum. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example from literacy so that it, it, it might resonate with, with others. There's an extremely critical concept called the alphabetic principle that all students must master typically in kinder or first grade. Mm, okay. They need to know what it is and what those letters are for right. and how those letters are associated with and connected to sounds. It's a foundational understanding. But a teacher can skip along through their curriculum introducing a sound at a time and a sound at a time and a sound at a time and a sound at a time without ever supporting the conceptual understanding, which means that the child is left without the ability to utilize that thing for its for its for its given purpose. Mm. Right. So okay. you can you can you can just drill the skills over and over and over and over and over again without actually having conscious awareness of what the concept that underlies the skill, the skill. Um, Heidi Mesmer, a fantastic um, literacy researcher that I that I enjoy reading. Um, she has a she's a wonderful video where she actually describes this in 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 action. Um, she was observing in a in a in a classroom where all of these little three and four year olds all knew their letter sounds. They all knew their letter sounds, and so she's she and she's she's flashing the cards, and they're all going they're all going g j b. Right. Yeah. And so she so she uses the, the example of 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 go. What would what would I use? What would I do if I wanted to write the word go, 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 go? And the kids were like this. Oh. <laughs> right. Because they didn't have the alphabet principle. It was a really um, it's a really uh, I love I love her telling the story. She does it at, in a, associated with her book, Letter Lessons and First Words. And it's a it's a really nice primer. Um, and and provides an, an understanding of how critical this concept is. So these these conceptual things, my my sets of knowns are driven toward these concepts and the creation of a kind of infrastructure. I like to think of it as a closet with hooks and bins and a, a rod and drawers and places to put things as opposed to a box in your house that is a rectangle where you throw clothing. Right. Right. Well, think of a closet without all of those, without the structure that goes inside the closet and it's basically a box. It's not a good thing. This right. is not a good thing. Right. You you may have closet space, but you don't have storage. And you certainly right. don't have retrieval, right? right? Right. So this issue of storing information and retrieving information is connected to webs of meaning. This is how vocabulary develops. Right. And yeah. you'll you, uh, you won't you won't be able to have declarative knowledge, for example, of the definition of a word. D that declarative knowledge comes later. It yeah. comes later, how a word is defined, but you'll have a pretty good hunch of what it means when you're mm -hmm. reading along yeah. enough to be able to sustain the reading. And you can go back and dig into that word if you choose to later on, but usually you garner enough to be able to know. It's sure. because you're associating that word with other words that you do know the meaning of. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So... so so, so and, I, and and the, these are these are these are these these are essentially webs, um, conceptual webs that are growing. And and so how like like a like an early career teacher that you're working with, you're 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 giving them this this understanding for how to create learning this this clover. Um, so like what what are the moves that teachers should use uh, to help kids develop this conceptual understanding? Uh, I mean, and let's just let's just focus with words. And my guess is that it's it's a lot simpler than it, than it could seem, um, but but probably requires some intentionality. So, so I'm a teacher. I want my students to know lots of words. Yeah, it, it requires it requires. 
requires intentionality yeah. and, and it requires a level of early explicitness. But here's we get this wrong in a lot of in a lot of ways. Um, so one of the things that you want children to know and that you want to instill really early on for five and six year olds is the letter sounds. It's the sound that the letter makes. OK. Not yeah. the letter's name that has right. that that moves them forward in their ability to be able to say g o g o go o go that's that that's that and, yeah. right and the g and the o right so so it's um words of, words is actually hard because you've gone down to it and gone down to a level but it's but it's but it's also terribly it's also terribly terribly interesting and i think that we've made things um wildly wildly complex so yeah. this gets to an area and here's a here's a challenge so one of the one of my big challenges and it's a challenge in in literacy learning in general it's a challenge in reading in general is we have a notion of prerequisites. Okay. First, I do this. That. Yeah. And this this kind of rigidity, it 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 literally is reinforced by the programs that we place in the hands of young teachers. This okay. rig rigidity, where where it's siloed. First, I learn this. And the students have to learn it to mastery. And because of the way that I'm implementing my classroom, everyone has to learn it to mastery. So I have to wait until the very last child to master that content has mastered every single one of those things. And in the in the in the world of phonics, connecting the phonemes to the to the graphemes, we have 42 of them that are spelled approximately 250 different ways. Some so, say forty. Some say forty-four. Be aware that that's not even a fixed a fixed number. So, do you wait until all of the little four-year-olds have all of the forty-four? That sounds like before you introduce them to be, words. That might be do, a bit do you wait, soul do, do you, sucking. Well, it's it can become <laughs> soul sucking, and there's a there's a there's a giant there's a there's a there's a challenge in in because we have a tendency to use this term mastery and and then we treat these as prerequisites when indeed they are co-requisites they are always co occurring pervasive integration is what's necessary for deep literacy to occur okay and co requisites we, versus prerequisites co-requisites they they're co-occurring you don't remove the meaning from the word while right. the child is learning how to decode and utter the word or pronounce the word correctly yeah you know, the meaning is there they already have it in their spoken language right so i get really passionate about this in part because mm -hmm. we are we have a tendency in many in many programs and approaches to dribble these things out one at a time Right. And we wait for mastery. Well, what okay. do we know in cognitive science? We need interleaving practice. Right. And spaced practice. They have to have others in order to juxtapose. So if I drill right. them for two weeks in mm, mm, that's the letter M, mm, mm. I show them the letter two weeks later and I say, today we're going to start with a new letter. The first thing the child's going to say is mm. So, they have to learn in juxtaposition. Right. And they have to be taught in juxtaposition. Isolating so these rapid, things. Rapid, 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 early, quick, and don't hold back. Keep pushing the content out, which sounds, mm. all of us have been taught this kind of developmental, to be developmentally appropriate, we have to withhold Ooh, because hoo, hoo. they're not ready. The notion of readiness, right? Yeah. No, what the child's waiting for is data. The brain needs the data. The brain wants the data, oh. right? And the brain is begging for the data, Dave. Uh, I, yeah, I mean. You're, I, I'll, you're... I'll show you an example. I'll, I've got, I don't know if this is gonna show up right. We'll see. Yeah, but it looks yeah. like so, so let's pretend that this is an X and Y axis, right? Mm -hmm. We're telling the little kid, and then we're saying, what's the pattern? Right. They need tons more points of data. need all of it. Now yeah. I've got a trend line. Oh, I see a pattern. So, I mean... 
It's you know, called statistical learning, by the way. It's actually grounded in science, so actual we, basic science. Okay. So, I mean, let's just, we are, we are in the deep end of the pool, which is where all the fun is and the mermaids are and the unicorns and the rainbows. Um, and the mermaids. Yeah. All so of let's, it. let's just continue. And let's <laughs> let's bring in where where you probably are seeing a lot of this, you know, basically, if I'm understanding right, the misapplication, um, you're you're describing common misapplications of what could be called the science of reading. I and and so the thing to be the thing to be aware is the science of reading is not one thing. And so and we use so the term science of reading. It's a slogan now, right? It's yeah, also yeah. a brand and marketing thing. So evidence based so science let's, reading. Let's let's put a pin in this this misapplication thing because I mm -hmm. want to get back to that because I think that's the real practical so what um in this in this whole in this whole science of reading uh kerfluffle and debate, uh which which has consumed many hearts mm -hmm. in in the last you know handful of years, has 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 consumed careers. Um, um, it, it's, it's, it's been kind of a high casualty conflict and I know that yeah. you're very passionate about it, obviously, because, because, you know, you spent your life researching these things yourself and understanding these things. And so, um, and so, yeah, anytime that a complex idea, uh, or, or a deep sophisticated idea or body of work, uh, like all the work around reading, how humans learn to read. Um, anytime that it becomes popularized in a slogan, in a phrase, in a few syllables, uh, yeah, it's it's when people like you and me, our hearts shatter into a thousand pieces because um, you know, it's it's kind of doomed to be it's distorted. It's distorted from its in original intent, so, right? So so distorted. Yeah. So the, it's and keep in, you're using the term popularized, and I would use the term monetized. Okay. And weaponized. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm seeing a uh, like you, it could be like both, stages, right? And, and I'm an adherent of, of science. I'm an adherent of science of science associated with literacy. I've been studying it my entire career. Basic I science. Mean, you're one of the people who taught Hume, me. Snowling. I I, I this, love this stuff. Earliest, I've, I feel like the the earliest deep conversations I had about early literacy were with you because I'm mm -hmm. I'm secondary literacy. My whole background. Mm -hmm. I mean, only in the last, you know, five, six, seven years have I started to pay really close attention to the early literacy work. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like, I mean, you're you you are one of the first people that, you know, got me uh, got me thinking about a lot of this stuff. So. Um, so. So, yeah, we, we get we get this popularization and then leads to it leads to monetization. It leads to this um, kind of like demonization weaponization of of certain groups uh so so like if if we could just clear the smoke away like where where did this go so awry because it it started with just looking at um look, looking at research looking at what's best for kids as so many educational wars do and it ended in this place, like you said, where there's massive amounts of money switching from this curricula to that curricula. So like, and keep in mind, issues? all of those curricula are owned by the same corporations. Yeah. Well, yeah. The insiders, the insiders and the outsiders hey. on any given day are still owned by the same umbrella, but that's a, that's all, that's all an aside. I'll, what, are the core, what are the core issues important. here? Um, in, in terms of, <laughs> In in terms of the people, the the you and us, the research, the the classroom mm -hmm. practitioners, like, what's at the heart of this problem? So, the, the 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 biggest challenge, and it's the wonderful thing about about basic science, and you do so much of this. These six things is full of it. The will to learn is full of it. Your principles course, your student motivation course, right. you are grounding 
everything that you are recommending in the very best that is known from basic science right. in, the, in and it's in cognitive science it's in it's in neuroscience it's in psychology it's in it, and and all of those areas by the way are also areas that are focused also on these challenges of literacy what's actually going on in the reading brain what do children need to be able to read but I, the the challenge is we've got two things that are going on at the same time. The basic science it illuminates challenges, problems, and new potential, and 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 in some cases wondrous um, instructional opportunities. Mm -hmm. In order to do basic science and have it be um, have it meet the um, the requirements of experimental, true experimental science, right? Or even quasi-experimental science. You need to isolate all of the variables right. to the greatest extent possible, which is why most of this kind of science is done in lab settings. Right. What we're learning from the actual science is how incredibly integrated, hear the word, mm -hmm. the processes are. Yeah, that are going on in the brain of an active reader. And when when a reader has difficulty, I am one, I'm a dyslexic. When a reader has difficulty discerning or difficulty in that in that reading process, they're utilizing sometimes um, less efficient neural networks. Hmm. And the ones that were intended, quote unquote, laid down for this purpose, it yeah. might make them slower. Okay. It might make them really, really have difficulty with spelling. I mean, like profound difficulty with spelling. And those are two very common problems, right? With with um, with children who we might consider to be to be dyslexic. But I need you to know that because you've got all of these um, these processes that are co-occurring when they're not when they're not isolated, very often. Um, that those 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 workaround processes will 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 benefit the learner and the learner will actually be capable of reading. Right. But they okay. don't read necessarily as quickly as you would like. Right. So but it, the, it, the issue the issue, though, is that in in the in the research setting, as opposed to in the classroom setting, these things have been isolated by design and they have to be isolated by design. To establish to the basic out, science, you have yeah, to you're isolate. trying you're trying to remove you're you're trying to remove um, variables that may be that may be damaging that may dilute your ability to show to show an outcome. So I've spent my life really trying to translate basic research into applied classroom research. What does it look like in the classroom? And when I when I try something and it kind of works, I'm constantly looking at all the other variables around it in the yeah. classroom setting because those also are at play. Yeah. And you can get to a point where you isolate um, in your assessment practices, you create proxies, and these proxies isolate very, very specific kinds of um, uh, foundational aspects of reading, and they're they're designed to isolate them. So you end up with comprehension, which is what reading is, sure. and then you have um, word recognition, and then you have the number of words a child can read correct. And then you have another thing that you tack onto that, the number of words a child can read correct per minute. Now okay. you've added time. Yeah. So I'm not learning from the assessment whether a child can read the words. I'm learning whether the child, how many words the child can actually read in 60 seconds. Yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, this gets into. It's just, in the week, right? Yeah. Well, just how, like I was working with an elementary group not long ago, but over mm -hmm. there, they're reading assessments and it really quickly becomes confounding, you know, like, well, and, the, and, and it becomes confounding because the minute that you, the minute that you layer time into, right. into that, if they, the estimates are that 15 to 20% of the population are quote unquote dyslexic. Okay. And I consider it to be, and, and by the way, the same percentage of 
people might have hazel eyes. I, I consider it to be a kind of neuro, neurodiversity. I don't okay. consider myself to be a bad reader. I'm a very exceptional reader in some ways. I'm a very slow reader, like ridiculously slow. Can't wait for this to come out in audio. <laughs> yeah, me too. I was just thinking okay, about that I'm really looking day. forward to it. And I really enjoyed the chapters that you read, right? I've read the whole book, but I'm I'm oh, eager good. to read it again and yeah. I'll listen to it and I'll I'll be able to glean a great deal from it. But but it it becomes this this translational this translational piece becomes becomes incredibly problematic. And the idea of the proxies that we're using to determine whether kids are proficient, when you add that 60 second timing in, you will always reconstruct a bell curve. Hmm. Okay. Which is wonderful if your intent is to ability group. Right, right. Right. And, and once you have ability grouped, you need to look at it through the lens of when a child is struggling in reading, they're not necessarily struggling for the same reason that the other struggling readers are struggling. Yeah. But they're okay. all placed in they're all now placed in one group without normative, so, normal, normally reading um students in which, that. I mean, <laughs> would would you say that a big, a big source of the of the problematic applications of this, um, the this monetized science of reading, has has just been that, as always, um, people are selling sort of the magic cure, to, to basically the difficult reality, uh, and that, they're claiming they're claiming that the magic cure is grounded in science. Right. And which, when, which again, when sometimes there's absolutely no science to support it whatsoever yet. Now, well, that doesn't mean there will not be. Right. They're also claiming that it's completely set. It was set in stone back in 1999, 2000, yeah. with the National Reading Panel report. And that nothing has happened since then that's changed anyone's mind at all about any of it. And and indeed, they're misquoting that that very valuable report that I use in my instruction every single day. Oh, so man. it's it's it gets it gets wildly it gets wildly complex but then the 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 other thing is you've got the uh, i i follow these scientists on a regular basis like i'm i'm a groupie i'm i'm i i i wait every saturday morning for tim shanahan to drop his blog i'm i'm eager for for mark seidenberg to do yeah. he he's he's very intermittent but when he does it's really powerful yeah. um i i follow David Pearson, I follow um, Marnie Ginsburg, I follow Jan Wasowitz, I follow a lot of people in right. part because they illuminate these really, these really powerful and really valuable um, areas where we 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 get into we get into book banning, we get into demonizing words. There are words that I can't use in my syllabi right now. If I use yeah. it, they will claim that I'm not adhering to the science. Yeah. A think tank will claim that my program doesn't adhere to the science and therefore she's teaching all of these undergraduate teachers not to understand what the science is or does. And at the same time, when I follow a scientist who's a pure scientist, he just does science. Um, uh, Seidenberg is a, is a classic example. He's describing these 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 integrated processes, how much explicit learning needs to take place and when implicit takes over and how darn important it is for get that to get that to get that ignition going. Yeah. And it's critically important, but that then the learning becomes implicit through the act of actual reading. So what I'm seeing is we've got all these prerequisites lined up. Well, one of the things you don't let them do is you don't let them read a book you haven't taught them how to read. No, they must be reading books, all kinds of books, every kind of book, all the time. And they also need decodables, and they also need books that are right. supporting very specific things. Yeah, um, and it, and it seems like this is so often the case where the 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 big buzzwordified and then eventually monetized and camp creating idea. Yeah. So science of reading today, um, you know, back back in the day, the the, the Common Core um gr growth mindset the, these types of things that, that take on this huge cultural weight and then you know like growth mindset that that was different because that was kind of that just became the right answer you know everyone ha has a growth mindset and you just you got to have it and once you check that box move on you're well motivated so that wasn't like a a demonization thing 
Um, right. maybe, maybe grit. Grit would be a good example, though. Oh, grit. grit where, was, grit's, grit's been misinterpreted and demonized. So, so misinterpreted right? and, and misused, right? Like And, and grossly misused. And, and, that's well, why, and that's why it mm-hmm. became demonized, because some of these misuses were just egregious. They're egregious. On, on, you know, kind of kind of student blaming and, and shaming mm-hmm. and just all these things that aren't in any of that. It's research, not in the research that 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 you know uh, you know Angela Duckworth and and all the people like no one would ever say like that's okay, um, and and so a long way of saying that what you're describing is basically like we should of course be informed by the basic science, um, mm-hmm. but but that means being really informed by it, and you can't be informed by it if you don't understand what it is. Uh, what it does conclude, what it doesn't conclude, and, and what those what those conclusions mean, because because they are being created in in artificial environments, laboratory environments. It doesn't discredit them. It just means that you know that context is super different from a classroom. And so the way that we take those principles and apply them to the classroom, I mean that's. That's that's where it, kind it of becomes is. critical, and and we hang now on every word of of researchers. I I remember, I remember Charles Hume um, in a in a presentation a couple of years ago being posed a question. He had just presented some some um, kind of cutting edge research where one of his findings was about. Um, the correlation between, and this is much of this is correlational, right? It's not causal. Oh, highly correlated with really successful readers is the ability to do um, rapid automatic naming of objects. So, you know, book, table, the faster you can name objects in the environment, this is all oral language, right? Huh. So naturally, when there's, a, when there's a lineup of people to pose questions, there's a very well-meaning, very thoughtful administrator. She's got the purchase order in her hands and she wants to know where she can buy that rapid automatic naming um, thing. And then she'll have her teachers implement it because that's got to be the thing that's the key because right. things aren't working now. And the problem is we're picking up on these tiny, these, these, these tiny pieces that have been isolated in the research and that have been correlated and we're calling them causal. Yeah, right. So and then, I mean, and, and they're not; they're correlated. They're part uh, of this ecosystem. Have you seen that that Dan Willingham book? When when should you trust the experts? Oh yes, it's great. <laughs> I mean, it, it it's kind of like if I can go back and do my school of ed again. I I, I just th- there should just be a class where mm-hmm. it's all about how to how to handle these these ways that research. And research, like legit research is used. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge, huge byproduct, right, of of this type of thing that we're talking about is you end up getting all your experienced teachers, they, they can't say research without quotation marks because they just don't trust any of it. No, it, it, they, it be, and in part, keep in so mind, sad. because they've been, they're being fed, that's right. they're, they're being, being fed misled. inferences from basic rab lat research, and they're trying to apply it to the complex classroom where every one of those learners has all of these processing systems that are co that are co occurring. Where yeah. something's been isolated, so one tiny thing has been isolated. And, so, and but here's the deal: it's brilliant for marketing because you can sell to the tiny things. The but tiny it's thing. So bad. <laughs> so every bad shiny, art. every shiny, tiny thing becomes another workbook opportunity. Yeah. So, so, so here's right? my question, Tammy. I mean, we're both, we're, we're both all in like education's. I'm our totally thing. in. And it's I totally career. want the science to inform my process. Right. Absolutely. And, and that totally was true pre science of reading, you know, heyday, um, and it'll be and it'll be true way after when when science of reading is something that you know pe- people barely remember uh, because uh, it's it's ten years down the road and we've had ten you know trends and, 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 and then wars. we're going to do this right right so we're going to keep we're just going to keep the swing. My my question instead is instead of coming down in this clear eyed middle and actually talking about the the problem is in these sides, both sides are right. Well, yeah, right. They're they're both and right. and both sides are wrong. Right, right. And yeah. so what I, what I what I tell teachers when I'm doing professional development, everything you do currently right now is absolutely the perfect and precise right thing to do. 
And they're all like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and then I say, and everything that you're doing right now is absolutely the worst possible thing that you can do. <laughs> I love and then I And then I pose the question, what's the factor that makes it the best or the worst thing? Mm. What's the factor? There's only one, always. Uh. Okay, what is one it? factor makes it the best perfect thing you could ever do, the precise best instructional thing you could possibly do. And and that very same factor will make it the worst thing you could ever do. Don't ever do it again. <laughs> Educational oh. malpractice. What's the factor? Uh, I mean, I have a few words in my head. What? So there's three things. Okay. We've got the what? That's the body of content. That can be your standards. We've got the how. That's a whole bunch of processes that have been imposed upon us and some that we've gleaned from that giant stew that we've discovered are really, really, really valuable. Yeah. And then we've got the kid. Right. We've got the who. Yeah. The who is what determines whether it's the best thing you've ever done or the worst thing you've ever done. And your ability to know what the child needs requires a completely different level of sophistication. Okay, so let, let's let's get into let's get into how how we help more people uh, mm -hmm. experience early success in teaching, yeah. and 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 become, you know, engaged career educators. That, that's yeah. what I'm going to call you and me <laughs> and the engaged. other people in this series <laughs> is engaged career educators. We're not calling ourselves master teachers. We're not calling ourselves as, you know, the, the ideal, but we're engaged for a career. We're totally engaged. And and I just believe that, like, that is such a piece that's at risk right now. It's um, very much at risk. We're, we're at risk of losing. We're at risk of losing our young teachers. They're leaving the field in right, droves. Right, right. And so, you know, both of us are, are passionate about this. Um, and I think a lot of people listening. They've got a heart for this too, because if if you're an engaged career educator, you want more people to to come in. You know, there, there's a lot of room in here, uh, and it's a and it's more fun. The more of us that are here, the better. So, like, you know, you just you just brought up how the student the student is kind of the the key factor, um, but one reality that we see is you know, more and more teachers are reporting that they they don't. They don't feel adequately prepared to help the students that are coming into their rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they feel overwhelmed with how many yeah. are coming, uh, how many uh, varying obstacles that are in those students' ways that, that are coming in. Uh, I, I just you know saw something in the New York Times this, this morning about how um, you know all the all the data on, on what happened with the COVID closures and the hybrid mm -hmm. schools and remote schools. And, and, and just, um, there's that, there's, there's all that fruit that we're dealing with. How do we help younger teachers to start to get their footing in an educational environment that seems to be, I don't know, kind of more difficult than, than it's been in a long time. It's one of the challenges that I'm seeing, and I, I see it with my students all the time, and and I see it in their field, in their field experiences. We have a really, we have really rich field experiences, and we're we're deeply grateful for our field um partners, for the schools that partner, mm -hmm. that allow my pre-service teachers and and my 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 graduate students are a completely different, completely different thing because they all are classroom teachers. They're successful classroom teachers under contract, or they can't be in the program. Okay. So that's a that's unlike any other yeah. um, program like it. It's that's it's great. very it's very different. And that and their and their administrators are aware that they're going to be doing they're going to be mm -hmm. doing research in their classroom on the efficacy of a whole variety of strategies, oh, which cool. is exactly what I want for my for my right. for my baby teachers. Right. But the challenge is they they i i have in in the among the among the schools who are the recipients of my of my students i think there must be probably six distinct programs that have been adopted oh wow now every one of those superintendents wants me to teach the program they adopted and guess what <laughs> the science doesn't support it 
The science, there's not one of them that the science completely, totally supports when you take the program apart there. So I have to prepare my students to go into environments where any of those things could be in place and where they may be told that they must read the script, they must read the script precisely, they must be on page 37 on Thursday, and next week they must be on page 72, and the week after that they must be on page 97 on this day when they are observed by this person. Yeah. And, that, and that if they fail to say the words in red in their teacher's manual, that they are at risk of being fired. <laughs> How can they meet the needs of the 25 individual little bodies, little children in front of them? And it even when, the needs the of their script, soul. The, when, they're, when, they're, when they're working. So the, the other, and the other thing is, in, in my day, when I started in school, they had not outsourced assessment. Now assessment's completely outsourced. It's being done on iPads, all kinds of stuff is going on. And usually it's done by an instructional assistant or even sometimes a specialist. And if the child has a problem, it's done by um, a school psychologist, or maybe uh, they're, you're, you're lucky to have access to a qualified speech and language pathologist. Anyway, all of that's being outsourced. The minute it's outsourced, now the, the teacher is like, well, there's a town in Montana called Butte. And Butte's a great mining town. And there were mules in the old olden days that would go into the mines and they would they would blindfold them. The mules would eventually go blind anyway because they were in the dark. They were kept in the dark the, their entire lives. That's what's happening to our teachers. They're blindfolded because they don't have access even to even to the data. Now they get a they get a really great sheet with all of the data information because we're so data driven in our in our instruction. And the sheet will say things like, he has 20 of 28, and then it'll give it a percentage. 20 of 28, what does that mean? <laughs> you don't know what to teach. There's only 28 letter sounds in the base, in the, when you're teaching the, when you're beginning and teaching the basic code, and you're teaching the, um, the short vowel sounds, typically when you do that, what the teacher needs to know is which ones the child, the student doesn't know. Right, right. Not a, not a getting, overall right? The number, The number tells them nothing. He tends to be low that. in fluency. Okay, he's not reading fast. That doesn't tell me that he can't read. Now, if I take away the 60-second barrier, the teacher discovers, well, lo and behold, he's reading. He's just, he's not, he's not very fluent because he doesn't get any practice. He doesn't get any practice because they're assuming he can't read, so they don't give him books. They give him word lists. So he's reading word lists, and then, right, and so the, the whole thing ends up going, going sideways um, on, on, these, on these poor young, these poor young teachers. So, my focus is on helping them be able to observe what the child is actually doing, to do a better job of formative assessment, in-class formative observation and assessment, to be able to come to some level of precision in, the, in, in regards to their instruction, and then also to be capable of doing um, rapid and efficient launching. So the ones who are gonna be teaching kinder, first and second grade, oh lordy, oh lordy. And, and if they're in a setting where that's not gone well and they end up teaching third, fourth, fifth, sixth, they've got, then you've got this, this enormous yeah. um, level of diversity and variability that's occurring within the classroom. It's diverse when they enter, it gets more diverse the longer they stay, especially if they're ability grouped. Your low group never ever right. catches up. And here you're talking about just just variation in level right. and, it, it, and it, ability at this time. Yeah, very very natural natural variation. It's not about not being able to do something. It's about not being able to do it in sixty seconds, or about it, it, the proxy is getting in the way. And it and it also makes it so that you're 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 panicked, right? You want to you want you want to find a way to meet the needs of all of these different children in front of you. And one of the first things that you, that you point to is, well, let's put, let's put them in ability groups. Let's move them. Let's move, let's move them around. And then you get all kinds of, all kinds of equity related issues connected to that. The problem is it dooms the students at the lower, at the lower level. John Hattie's work on this is very, is very, very clear. And those are meta-analyses, right? Yeah. So 
Right. And, and know that in, in the stew of a meta-analysis, there's a lot of lots of information is lost in translation. However, that that is that is you will you will follow them through, and the ones that are the ones that are identified in a low performing group will still be in a low performing group if grouping is how you've done it when they're in sixth grade, when they're in eighth grade, and then they're going to be um, targeted into into lower tiered tracks in high school. So it seems like. The central thrust of of your strategy and instruction and coaching of these teachers is to, to you know to humanize these systems, focus on the human. Yes. That, that follow the with. follow 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 what you what you see as the needs of the child. Be yeah. very thoughtful in how you are pairing and 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 how you are uh, manipulating the social context of that classroom so that children of a wide variety of abilities work with each other. You will find that kids will find and they will gravitate toward the one who has the thing they need the most mm. in really unusual and unique ways. And that these are these are mutually mutually beneficial um, learning learning. Um, settings, if you will, um, that, that, that benefit kids a lot. Whenever you, um, and this is very true when we talk about social and emotional learning, if you look at kids who are emotionally dysregulated, who might be considered to be, um, have um, levels of emotional disturbance or other, uh, just dysregulated is a better yeah. way of thinking about it, because I don't, the yeah, labels, just, the, labels be, the labels be damned, just dysregulated. Mm -hmm. What do they require? Well, I mean, a stable environment to be around an adult who's regulated, co-regulation. Co-regulation. They need to be in the midst of others who have that who skill, regulated. Yeah, who've developed right. that skill, yeah. who who have more stamina, who have more ability to stay on task and right. and within within that context. And and it, the issue the issue of this regulation needs to be self-regulation hmm. it can't be regulation by program or regulation by other yeah right right it's kind of like the, the minute the minute you do that the minute the teacher's the one imposing and everyone does what she says and everyone yeah. everyone's flipping their hands and they're doing all the they're doing all the prompts that teacher steps out of the classroom and those kids have no idea how to behave or what to do they're not self-regulated right Right. They're just they've been they've been regulated by the environment. They've been regulated by other. They've been regulated by systems. They've been regulated by programs. They've been regulated by. And 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 so self-regulation is a is a giant another another giant factor. Right. Now, does this does this tie into some of your work on managing classrooms for joy and resilience? Mm -hmm. Because I it know that does. you've done some it's, on that. It's yeah. deeply, it's deeply important. And it gets to it gets to something really really significant about teachers. Um and and not just students. Students, students need self-regulation, not regulation by other. When they've internalized right. it, they're the ones doing the regulating. They're the ones that are going, okay, I need to calm myself down. Okay, I need to get myself on task. Okay, yeah. I need to be, you know, I they're they're the ones that are they're the ones that are doing that. That's that is our goal, right? Yeah, and and and, it, and why? Because how are you gonna flourish long term? You're not gonna flourish long term. How am I gonna in do order that? If to, I can't in order to myself? achieve that goal, one of the things that children need are choices levels of autonomy yeah. that allow them opportunities and those are also opportunities to fail and these hyperscriptic curricula obviously they don't allow you don't have, there's they, there's no failure okay there's no so, there's, there's almost no learning there's no failure i mean when you're working with a new teacher and they've got a curricula that's that scripted and an administrative uh guidance that like you must be on page are you ever tempted to just say like keep looking for a job, <laughs> you know, like, well, like keep it, resume interesting, fresh. You know, we've got, we yeah, have these, we have these unusual, intense. these unusual circumstances. We've got, we, what I've learned is how to really examine with, with incredible, um, with incredible care when I can get access to the teaching materials that are being used within the schools, which is not always easy. Um, these are highly controlled substances. Well, Easier yeah, to get right. methanol and oxycodone than it is to get a hold of wonders. Yeah. 
yeah. or injury, right? So when I can, when I, when I, when I have the opportunity to really review the materials really, really carefully, I can show my pre-service teachers the very best routines that exist within that program because, just like I said, yes. everyone's right and everyone's wrong. So you can, there's garbage, so slimy really banana peels, them. and there's right. gems in them. There hills, You're right? Them focus on the and, gems. And so, Go teaching on teaching them then how to be discerning and Which how to identify kinda, routines that are likely to be that are likely to be highly impactful and then really i good. say that's so really you good. need to throw that. this part away and you need to really emphasize this routine which is going to be really beneficial but then there's another thing you've got to be doing simultaneous to that that's not being done by this program at all and every single time it comes back to what you and i learned from mike schmoker yeah, right. That's how writing. Done it. Literacy, yeah. Writing, yeah. writing, writing, writing. The tumbler of thought is reading, writing, and talking. Okay, let's let's uh let's let's shift to this. <laughs> if 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 we could wave our magic wand, you and me, and uh we're gonna make the 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 national US educator reading list. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, 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 I'm right now, my mailbox is just filling with hate mail <laughs> by even uh, questioning, by even making the question. <laughs> so, so, but, but I'm just saying like, like, uh, you know, Mike Smoker has influenced both, both you and I, like, like his Usually, book yeah. Focus. Um, it's just, it's just one of those really clarifying, grounding, uh, kind, kind of timeless books for educators Yep, that, that can, that can serve as a compass. When you find yourself in a system where 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 it does feel incredibly top heavy and and scripted, you know, mm -hmm. uh, paced down to the day type of a thing, um, what, what are what are other books for for people watching this? Because because maybe there's an early career teacher who's like, I wish I could be like Dave and Tammy and have this sense of confidence. Because I mean, I think that's really what you and I have, Tammy. Is is we don't have all the solutions, but we do have a we know enough about our profession, about the research, to, to be able to, if we're given a new initiative or or we get our hands on a curriculum, we can look at it intelligently and, and make good decisions. Um, so, so and, like, and, and we can find the good, we can find the good that, that is there. Right? Yeah. And, and continue in our careers, right? Because the goal here and is- continue, And continue to feel like we are, that we have efficacy, that we yeah. actually- that we actually seriously are making a difference in what we're doing with kids. So it's it's very it's very it's very dynamic and it's very interesting. So you know, what, what other books? I, what other books that a teacher can go grab would help with that? I mean, let, let we'll put Mike Smoker's focus on there. You can't mm -hmm. you can't say any any uh, mm -hmm. any books written by you and me? Okay. So what what books? What other books do you think are just essential reads for teachers early in their career? So I'm when I'm in the weeds when I'm in the weeds of literacy honestly yeah. one of the one of the areas that has been wildly like grotesquely um under undertaught poorly taught undertaught and really since no child left behind almost completely ignored is the area of writing and when we look at writing developmentally, it's very, very different. So it depends on the developmental, on the on on what what age you're working yeah. with, right? right? It's very, 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 very central and very, very critical. There's um, so I I want open ended a period of time for open ended writing right away right away when the child is still scribbling because I can actually observe through their developmental spelling, their reading proficiency. Mm. Okay. It's the most telling element for me to determine what they understand about the alphabetic principle. Right. Yeah. 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 It, in, it, and it's incredibly, incredibly valuable. So a book that I have really liked and I like all the approaches that are speech to print um, but many of these don't have books connected to them. One of them has a heuristic connected to it called the Language Literacy Network, created okay. by a woman named Jan Wasowitz. And it is it is exactly right on. I know theoretically that everything that this is that her it's a it is a heuristic. It's a it's a it's a graphic that she's created to try to talk about the significance, the importance of speech or expressive language to receptive language and the relationship of those two things, sure. starting with 
speaking and listening and going to writing and then reading, right? And so these expressive language and receptive language have two different manifestations. One is the language that I use that I talk and I listen, I speak yeah. and I listen. And then the other is the writing. And Jan Wasowitz's work in that particular model is amazing. And it was passed on to me by um, Tim Shanahan last summer. He, okay. he, I, I'd ask him a question because I've been really following all these different models of reading from the simple view of reading to the new active view of reading, Duke, Cartwright, amazing, amazing huh. work. It includes motivation. It's huh. All over this book, okay. it includes motivation. But so, so I am looking at these, and but Wasowitz's is a developmental model. When I posed the question to Shanahan, he said, "Here's what you need to look at," and it's amazing. So the other thing, um, cool. there's some very very good books that have some very simple guidance for teachers associated with speech to print. One that I like particularly is by Olette and Gentry called Brain Words that hmm. deals with this issue of words. And it, lo and behold, privileges writing. Hmm. Which, by the way, Don't this is the it. early, we're talking, we're talking about in the early, in the early years, in the early grades, right? And their, their initial writing is going to include phonetic spelling. And the degree to which it becomes increasingly conventional is showing you literally where they are in the stages of their reading development. And, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a miraculous thing. It's writing is a miraculous thing. Yeah. Well, guess how guess how expensive it is. Yeah, not, not. It's 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 eighty nine cents. It's ten cents ten cents per kid at Walmart at the beginning of a school year to buy right. spiral bound notebooks. Right. Yeah. Ten cents. And That's all right. and, and and so they need writing, they need writing materials and they need, and the teachers need freedom to do it. And what we it, it's the only action research project that 100 percent of my graduate students had to do last year. And in every one of their settings, from preschool all the way to eighth grade, the results were well, the word that we've used, and my my students, my students, they've now named us this. This is our group name, gobstoppers. <laughs> because I kept saying that is gobstopping, and then I I start to run the statistics on these things because we were we were it, we we literally did really really it, it can't be called experimental research, but it was close to quasi experimental, and we had triangulation from three different data sources, and those data sources are um, highly reliable and highly valid, and also allow me to run matched pair t tests and then i've got a way of being able to show whether or not it's actually causal i mean it, how so likely was is it that ended. this new thing we did is causing this outcome we're seeing and the outcome what was, was the just thing? wildly universal in what, terms of literacy development what was the new thing that you did and what was the outcome they wrote every single day for 25 minutes a day on topics that they chose Okay, so open from, ended from preschool writing. all the way through eighth grade, and the outcomes were statistically significant at the point zero 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 nine level. Okay, like like we're not we're not talking point zero five. We're talking yeah. These were and they were correlated with dramatic increases, particularly in the preschool, kinder, and second and third grade students. Dramatic, and I mean dramatic increases in the number of words correct per minute they could read on the on the district's actual assessment. Wow! And it was shocking. But this is the first thing that's 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 thrown away because with it only costs 10 cents curriculum. nobody's making any money off of it right so this it is only cost 10 cents this is open ended 25 minute 25 minutes writing for usually how many i days? open i use that opening moment to do a read aloud and then i sometimes have something that's come directly out of what the students wrote the previous day that i'm going to do a short lesson on but it is a it is invaluable and it was thrown away in most of our systems when we began doing No Child Left Behind, because we were only testing two things. What did we test? Reading and math. And reading, I'm, I'm no longer using that. I, 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 want, I want us to be focused on literacy writ large, because when we remove right. the expressive aspect and we're only focused on reading, which is the receptive outcome, we have literally, it's like taking a swimmer, taking their one arm, 
tying it behind their back and <laughs> dropping them into the English Channel and saying, go for it, swim, swim harder, yeah. swim faster, kick those feet. And that one arm is just going like crazy. We've got to have them both. Mm. And so the rest, and 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 even Louisa Moat's speech to print, Jan Wasowitz and the and her this this language literacy network is really it's a very very powerful model. But the writing, the writing, the writing, the writing, the writing. And so one of the other things that I do is when you begin to introduce and you're working them toward conventionality, I learned wonderful things from Hockman and from from Hockman's method, the writing revolution. Yeah. I've learned wonderful things, but on a developmental level, you still have to have that base of everyone writing every day right. because it's what the child wrote that tells you what they need in relation to that, in relation to that method. They have to have draft. They have to have a draft of something. You don't have, you don't have anything until you have a draft, right? You know how, how long you've worked with editors on the processes of your books, Right. Right. It, yeah. The draft is everything. You've got to get some, something has to come out of you yep. and get on the page. Yeah, it's true. Right? You're not, and, you're and, not but this, anywhere but, without but that. Every, every one of these researchers, and they're talking about it in very unique ways. Um, my, my, I remember my, my old colleague at the University of Montana, who was a speech and language pathologist, Lucy Hart Paulson. She had all kinds of research on this early developmental writing that was that was that was literally speech to print. So writing is a manifestation of spoken language. Mm. In order to do it, the child has to have the alphabetic principle. So if we look at the strands in the Common Core standards, what are they? Yeah, reading, reading writing, foundations, speaking, reading listening. literature, reading information, the three oh, readings. Right, right. And then we've got writing, speaking, listening, and language. Language is a combination of vocabulary and grammar. Grammar, right. Right? So it's this it's this morph of vocabulary and grammar. When they're actually writing, they're doing 100% of the reading foundations actively. 100%, all of it. They have to segment the word that they're saying in their head in order to represent it with the symbol, and they orthographically map that onto the page, and that becomes a written word on the page. So if it's they're teacher... also doing grammar, they're also doing vocabulary. And so I'm saying language is being is being addressed, yeah. writing is being addressed, and reading foundations are being addressed. Then when they turn around and they read what they have just written, what's the degree to which they're highly likely to be very fluent reading what they've just written? Yeah, yeah, probably pretty good. Uh, and are they engaged? If, yeah. If a teacher's in doubt of what to do tomorrow, maybe right some right. writing would be a so, good idea. So I, I love, <laughs> I love your model. I love your model, David, of the, of the, of the, your, your nine moves. Oh yeah, right? yeah. Which was your response? It was your response to um, to Schmoker. Right. I did the same thing, and mine has write your way in and write your way out. The oh, opening God. and closing. Yeah, it's a sandwich. Cool. Write your way in and write your way out. It's yeah. more than an admit and exit ticket. Mm. But it can be as simple as an admit and exit ticket. But it but it typically is more than that because it's usually it usually demands more thinking. What are the ways in which the heroine of our story changed in the last chapter that you just read? Be specific. What changed? Mm. Well, at the beginning of the period, you know, if she seemed rather selfish and she didn't have very much, she wasn't paying very much attention to the needs of her family or her sister. But at the end, she had this welling of compassion, but she was also feeling so ashamed. Right? I mean, yeah, that's so you well, the, 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 and, how does and, that and tie it, into the self-regulation pieces too yeah. that we were talking about, right? Like, it's, 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 so I have I have the exact same thing that you have, and I did it with the with the Birch Park House unit and some of the other curricula that I've written. Cool. But it's 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 my moves, and it starts with write your way in, and then it goes to a segment of building background knowledge. So think of it: write your way in four minutes, three minutes. Yeah. Building background knowledge might take five, might yeah. include some vocabulary, might not. Right. Right? right. Might 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 be literally content um content driven. Then I do a short demonstration, right? I'm using gradual release of responsibility, a short demonstration, depending upon the needs of the student, how short or long it might be, usually where I'm working my way through some aspect of the book that we're about to do, then I drop them into cycles of guided practice punctuated by conversation in between about every mm, eight minutes 
Okay. Seven minutes, six minutes, stop, talk to your partner, stop, talk to your table, stop, talk to your group, stop, let's, let's, and, and sometimes I'm randomly doing that. Then I cut them loose after several cycles of that for independent practice. And before the class closes, little tone goes off and I, and I have them write their way out. Write your way out. And the writing their way out is a very specific thing that I'm going to have them focus on. You notice the setting changed. How did the setting change? What did that do to you? And how did you feel as a consequence of the way the setting was described? Hmm. Very simple, but targeted. It's just right. boom, 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 boom. In in Montana, our we have a wonderful, um, a wonderful, wonderful education director for our Montana Historical Society. Her name is Martha Cole, and she's adopted the write your way in and write your way out oh, in nice. in our social studies curriculum. But I've also adopted the Hockman method. So sure. one of my favorites from Hockman, and not during writing. You can't do it during writing. If you do it during writing, they put their editor on their shoulder and they don't, they don't write anything. You get nothing. Right. So the editor has to be off the shoulder. So yeah. I will actually have them do a perfect sentences dictation activity that I grade real time in the class, but it's going to be connected to the essential paragraph in the social studies reading or the science reading for the subsequent week, next week's. So hmm. I have... I have one that I have one that I did for Creston School where I said, send me the essential reading that you want them to read in science or social studies. They sent me for fifth grade this this um, quite complex um, <laughs> two page. It would have been like Wikipedia for kids. It was it was National Geographic for kids okay. on hydrology. It has one paragraph in it that has the entire water cycle. Wow. That's so cycles dance. and systems concept. That's yeah. Water cycle content. Yeah, Skill okay. set. Now I'm going to do I'm so I break that apart into five sentences and we do a dictation activity, a perfect sentences activity with those five sentences throughout the week. Now I've affected 30 or 40 repeated readings of those sentences. They know the water cycle. Bam. They've got all this knowledge right. and they know the vocabulary, hydrology, vapor, evaporate, um, condensation, all the, all the all the, language all, of clouds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They've got all they've got all the vocabulary. When they get to reading that passage the next week, I have created the opportunity for every one of my students, the low reader and the high reader in the exact same classroom to thrive in that setting. Mm. Then the next week you do it with a social studies article. Think of it like article of the week, only what yeah, you're right. doing is you're treating your actual textbook material. Right. Like an article. As if it is. And, and you, but, but what it does to the teacher, I have to figure out what's really essential and what's going to give them the greatest possible bang for the buck. But at the same time, I'm teaching declarative sentences. I'm teaching, I'm teaching, I'm teaching complex and compound sentences. Mm. I'm teaching all of the spelling within whatever that sentence is. The perfect sentences is perfect sentences. Initial capitalization and end punctuation. All the language, all the vocabulary, all the spelling. Pervasively integrated. Integrated. Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. Well, <laughs> um, write your way in, write your way out. Write your way in, write, write I, your way out. And, and gonna, then when you're doing something where you're going to be teaching about the grammar and the spelling and all those all those conventions, associate it with a meaningful passage connected to science and social studies learning and don't associate it with what they just put on the page. That's the source of your mini lesson for the next day. Otherwise, they just stop. They just go, I can't write right, so I'm not going to write. Yeah. Right. No writing going on here. Don't watch me making any mistakes. I've learned the more I write, the more errors I make. Therefore, write less, make fewer errors. And that's how we get your ninth grade students who won't write a single paragraph in response to an article of the week essay assignment. Mm. So you have to. You she have said to, swigging her coffee <laughs> like you, I need coffee. <laughs> you got to get them. <laughs> same. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to get them deep disassociating you've got to disassociate the teaching of the conventions from from the creation of their original whatever they're writing you've you know, got to disassociate those you don't want you don't want to you don't want to go down the road of if they're if they're playing perfect poly they're playing they're playing for a lack of fluency you can't be perfect poly perfect poly we have editors for a reason right dave stewart that's right 
That's we have right. editors for a reason. I can't play perfect poly and still draft. No, yeah. I can't do it. No. I got it. I have to I have to be free to draft, and that means I have to be free to make mistakes. That's we don't right. let our kids be free to make mistakes. They have to be perfect every time. Yeah. But I'm going to explicitly teach it. I'm just not gonna do it right there. Okay. So so then their writing becomes a source of data. So as we as as we as we as we approach the the landing strip here, this is a great yeah. this is a great segue though because um, these same problems that our students can experience when they're obsessing over being being perfect, being right, doing doing it right, and then the demotivation that eventually happens there, right? When my right. when my definition of success is that it has to be correct, it, it in every letter, every jot and tittle. Um, well, well, now efficacy belief is evaporated. I, I can't succeed, so right. I'm just not going to try. Well, what a if lot they've of been teachers, ability group? What's happened to their belonging belief? So, 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 but here's my question: because the teachers can get ability group too. I'm bringing it back to to teachers, and and how how do we help them to to sustain their motivation uh, mm. to to the point where they can they can get good, get competent, yeah. um, and get excited about how much there is to learn about in teaching. Because I think, you know, you and I have that in common and we haven't been in education the same number of years, but we've been in it long enough to where we've, we've read all of this stuff and yet we're just still interested. Um, yeah. you, you've cited authors. Uh, I've, I've talked about authors that are still getting us thinking and learning about teaching. So I, I, I love these books. <laughs> so like, like what advice would you give to the earlier career educator watching this? Who's just like, you know, that they're, they're in that place. Like, like, like a lot of your grad students are and your undergraduate students. Um, well, no, like, like your grad students, they're, they're actually in a school. They're, they're, they're in, the situated in a school. Um, but, but, you know, it, it, it just seems overwhelming and, and, and frustrating and disheartening even, you know, I've got this, this curricula, like what, what are your advice your 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 uh your piece of advice for these people to experience flourishing uh to mm -hmm. to, to experience um this the sense of okayness and engagement that you're just described you just described facilitating that for students so, with this so the, writing the the crazy thing is the teachers So students are losing autonomy and the classroom is less and less about them. And teachers are losing autonomy and the classroom is less and less and less in their control. And at the same time, principals are terrified. They're yeah, scared right. to death. They're, they are in a state of, there's there's virtually nothing they can do that's right, right? And mm -hmm. superintendents the same way and it keeps, it, it, it yeah. keeps rolling. It keeps rolling. <laughs> yeah, there's kind of no one that's... I want, I want them to fearlessly carve out of their of their school day, fearlessly carve out pockets of time to do high effectiveness routines. That can be around the teaching of phonics. That can be around the teaching, the, the, the utilization of writing, which is gonna consolidate all of those things. It has a dramatic effect. It's an unbelievably dramatic effect when you do it. And, and but, but to carve out, to carve out space. Often they're going to have to carve it out outside of the English language arts block. Mm, yeah. They have to do it outside of that. And here's the, here's the other problem. And I, I, I want, I want everyone to know really clearly when you do that and you do it effectively, and then you start to see, you start to see growth and you start to see outcomes. The principal and the coach who are supervising you think it's the program they adopted. Mm. Now you've confounded the data. So now you have to find a way of being able to communicate what you've done without getting fired. They usually won't fire you when you've been successful. Right. But to communicate, to, to communicate what you've done, to be able to carve out that little pocket of space. Um, mm. That's why I'm using the Hockman method connected to science and social studies reading, because I can carve out space. 
I can create wow. space in a day that is so densely packed. So find a small thing that you can do that rehumanizes your classroom, that introduces good humor and well-being, that makes it clear to your students that their individual and unique lives matter, right? Mm. Right? And we're yeah. all of the all of the things that 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 lead to teacher credibility. Find pockets that you can do during that day that do that. That flourishing menu is a, it, it is an example of finding pockets. But we have to do that, and we have to rehumanize that, and then we have to find ways of behaving with compassion, not only within the context of the learning community that we're creating in that classroom with those kids, but also with our colleagues and our supervisors. And I mean, all the ones whose heads roll, right? In the, in, in this in this um, environment of, well, frankly, um, it, damning public schools. I mean, the, mm. the, the 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 point of all of this is to make public schools not exist in the way that public schools exist today. It's a, yeah. it's, a you think it's, that's not, what, it's not it's not it's not without going. it's not without some some deep deeper intent that that the public education is under attack um my, my teacher preparation programs are under wild attack um oh, yeah. it's it's sure. we're 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 just branded from and in every in only only by by the way associated with reading right mm. because our programs are designed we have we will have typically a methods class that's pre-K through eighth grade. So you get to teach wow. that in 15 weeks or 10 weeks in my case, <laughs> right? What, what, does an in, eighth in grader need that the, what does an eighth grader need that the four-year-old entering kindergarten or five-year-old entering kindergarten also needs? Wow, that is Not quite much, a range. Right, and quite, quite the range. range. <laughs> and, and so the, the amount that has to be covered and it can't be covered by endlessly expanding, ballooning our programs. We have to be we have to be incredibly precise. Um, for for my students, I'm I'm I I have found um, I use Marnie Ginsburg's streamlined pathway for do, doing those do, doing those early phonics with with effectiveness and with efficacy. And I really love the way that she pulls in um, later. If you've taken her course, she pulls in um, uh, even more work on a stamina building and the, and the reading practice is, is really, really, really precise. Um, but again, not, not as much writing in that. So you have to balance whatever is, whatever is working, but what she does that's, that's brilliant is she doesn't have, she does not operate on the notion of mastery to prerequisite. She says, no, you probably have to give them more data. They can't yeah. see a pattern when they've only yeah. got one dot, right? You've got to give them more data. And usually when I find that a kid is floundering in reading, it's literally because the program has dribbled it out. It's, it's gone. It's slowed down to the point. Yeah. And, and and so you don't you don't have the opportunity for recall practice based on interleaving practice. It's it's violating all of the all of what we know about cognitive science, right? right. And it's simultaneously it, it while it may be highly systematic, they it's they learn from the juxtaposition. They have to juxtapose all of those. It can't, it's got to be co-requisites and they have to be they have to be actively engaged in reading and actively engaged in writing when they're doing that early work. That early work requires that they have these opportunities to consolidate. Those things have to co-occur. It's not, I'm going to teach them all their letters and sounds, and then I'm going to let them write later on. No, no, no. Co-occurring. Co-occur. Co-requisites. I like that. That's a Pervasive that integration, right? Yeah. Well, I think that, that that is such good practical advice for the teacher listening who's struggling, the administrator listening who's struggling i mean i like that you spoke to uh, all the folks that that feel like kind of their backs against the wall and and they're afraid and they're they're under pressure and under attack i, I want them i want them so badly to be able to relinquish the fear yeah right and yeah. And, and fear the fear in some of our settings is very very real but until oh, they can yeah. relinquish the fear they can't even experience in that classroom the joy because there's too much anxiety um, everything is anxiety producing, by the way. And we, uh, one of my students did action research. Her individual action research was on um, what happened when I, when she removed the 60 second timer from the words, correct. Mm. When she removed the, guess what? 
first of all, the kids were able to read far, far more. But she, after she'd done it for three or four weeks, when she reintroduced the timing element, there they were. She was still monitoring whether they, how much they were reading in sixty seconds. They were going up and up and up and up and up. But she wasn't letting them know that she was actually had the had split timer on to determine how many words they had read. And and once she removed the anxiety, <sighs> yeah. So fear is affecting every at every level within the system. Those kids are fearful because they're going to be placed in a walk to read group and they're going to be identified as a loser at age five. Uh, I'm a reading loser. Yeah. I'm I'm a reading loser because I'm and and if you think that the kindergartners don't know, they know. I had a I had a I had one of my students come to me, one of my pre-service educators come to me. She was she was doing a full full-on substitute gig in the school that she had attended as a child. She knew the school really, really well. And she was doing it in the kindergarten. And she was doing what she'd been taught to do. And she had the students, had the students working in small groups and doing this and doing that. And they were, they were, um, they were doing really, really excellent instruction. In fact, she what the 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 instructional consultant from the state came in during the time that she was doing this and said, wow, that was amazing. You did, that was a beautiful lesson. You really did a beautiful job. Well, she has one little boy in the classroom who just goes into full meltdown mode. Mm -hmm. And he was in meltdown mode because I'm not in the low group. I can't work with him. Mm -hmm. He's in the low group and I'm in the high group and I'm not supposed to work with him. They'd always been ability grouped. Right. Unless and they knew it. Way. Every single one of those little five-year-olds knew who was the in the upper group because they were reading real books and who was in the lower group because they were reading word lists. Mm -hmm. You get what you allow, right? And that's what I want pre-service, my pre-service teachers to know. You get what you allow. Sure. Did you allow them to actually experience real reading and real writing? Do they know that it's valuable and fun? Or are they doing exercises? And it gets to differences in the way that we define literacy and the way that we define reading. So for some of our researchers, they've had to define it down to a narrower and narrower thing, right? Yeah. In order to in order to isolate, they've defined it very, very, very narrowly. It's just decoding. It's just word reading. Yeah, and we need them to do that. But we and we need them. We, we need the can't. scientists to do that because we right. need to we need to know. But in our classroom, in our classroom right. practice, if they're decoding and not comprehending, then I've got I have created a problem. I have done something very, very damaging. And you end up getting those kids who just they can read anything. Here are the directions I'd like to guide the conversation. This is what we're going to do. And that would and capture a long term conversation in about 20 minutes. And then we all enjoy ourselves. And, and, and then you ask them, what what did they read? What was that about? And they go, what do you mean about? Yeah, I read every word. I don't right. know. I don't know. <laughs> well, Tammy, you've given us much to think about today, dear colleague, and uh, and I think people know what I'm talking about now. At the start of how these these conversations, I mean, I've got an index card filled. Um. <laughs> so, uh, so um, I'm gonna uh, link below to any of these things that that you've mentioned that um and and and, and we can kind of connect if there's anything else that you want me to 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 let people uh explore and check out mm -hmm. um but there, there's just so much here and i hope that people have uh, walk away encouraged and and just just inspired that it's possible to build a career um oh it's the this, most it's the most rewarding profession. career it's yeah. really truly and 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 this too will pass right we're in we're in yeah. a swing like this now it's going to go the other way no right. get, in the middle, right. get in the middle and stay there um follow the work of bruce howlett there's somebody to follow bruce howlett. okay yeah because he's he's literally trying to pick these to pick these pieces apart to identify the routines what are the routines that are actually working from all of this and i think he's on to something i think it's a really good a really, really good um, thing. There's a there. I there's 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 excellent things that are happening, but we've got to get off of this. Yeah, yeah. It and it's not good. It's not good for us. No, no, <laughs> no. And the way we do it, one way we do it is conversations like this. So thank you so well, much, my friend. 
Thank you, thank you, Dave, and uh, my my love to Crystal and the kids. And absolutely, I, I hope to see you back in our state someday. I do <laughs> too. I do so. too. Especially your part of it, which is so gorgeous. <laughs> it's a pretty um, special place. 